It helps to stay fit if you expect to keep the pace in the NFC's Eastern Division. For the second straight year, the Washington Redskins, the Dallas Cowboys, and the St. Louis Cardinals were engaged in a down-to-the-wire dogfight for two playoff spots, and St. Louis strongman Conrad Dobler wanted to be ready. Last week's most crucial matchup pitted Don Coriel's eight and three Cardinals against Tom Landry's eight and three Cowboys. And the great game possibilities made everybody smile. While St. Louis and Dallas played for undisputed first place, George Allen led his seven and four Washington Redskins into Atlanta for a game that figured to be a laugher. But the win hungry Falcons didn't even crack a smile. The up-and-coming Falcons matched Washington's honorary gaffers stick for stick. And through it all, the youngsters didn't show a bit of respect for their elders. Super rookie Steve Bartkowski, number 10, thumbed his nose with a 50-yard rainbow which sifted right through the hands of Washington's Bryant Salter and into the arms of Atlanta's Wallace Francis. Atlanta's impudent behavior was answered by rickety Bill Kilmer, limping on a broken bone in his left foot, but still able to airmail the ball to lonely Frank Grant. Billy Kilmer just might throw the ball better with a broken foot, if you can believe 25 completions for 320 yards. The competition was stiff, but with each passing week, Steve Bartkowski seems better able to hold his own on a big league level. In his shootout with Billy the Kid, Bartkowski completed 14 for 281 yards, including this long gainer to Alfred Jenkins. To go along with an abundance of physical talent, Bartkowski has a precocious instinct for calling the right play. At the goal line, Redskin backer Chris Hanberger blitzed, a popular tactic against the rookie quarterback. But Bartkowski countered with setback Dave Hampton on a swing into Hanberger's vacated area for an easy touchdown. Behind Steve Bartkowski, the surprising Falcons pulled into a 27-27 tie before Bill Kilmer went into his weekly Houdini act. With 56 seconds left in the game, Kilmer escaped the rush for five straight completions, just as he had done the previous week in a win against Minnesota. Kilmer's cool gave Mark Mosley a chance for the win with two seconds remaining. For the fifth time in 75, a Redskin game was decided on the final play. While Washington survived 30 to 27, St. Louis quarterback Jim Hart was testing a tender knee under scrutiny of the Dallas Cowboys. In the previous 11 meetings between the two teams, Dallas had won nine times and the confident Cowboys look to a wealth of big game experience to pull them through once again. St. Louis hopes rested with a gimpy need quarterback and a gently lofted prayer. Somehow the prayer escaped three Dallas defenders and nestled snugly in the grateful grasp of terrific Terry Metcalf. Metcalf couldn't quite believe that one himself, but Jim Hart was on the right track, and there was nothing sloppy about touchdown number two. Tiny Mel Gray took his turn in the end zone as the eager Cardinals gratefully accepted a surprising early advantage. A repeat documents the classic NFL bomb. Hart simply threw the ball as far as he could, and Mel Gray outran everybody in a blue shirt. The St. Louis bombing run set a tempo that Cowboy quarterback Roger Staubach was unable to match. Without a consistent pass rush from the front four all season, St. Louis depends on team defense, like a surprise double blitz to keep an opponent off balance. With Staubach properly confused, Jim Hart continued to chew up the Dallas defense with impeccable pass protection from an offensive line that has allowed him to be sacked only six times all season. 
The hands belong to Ike Harris, a fourth round draft choice in 74 who played instead in the WFL. Harris finally came to St. Louis this season and soon took a starting position away from Earl Thomas with catches like this one. Hart to Harris set up a just enough touchdown vault by number 34, Steve Jones. And amazingly, the St. Louis Cardinals took a 28 to three halftime lead over the unbelieving Dallas Cowboys. There have been many seemingly hopeless predicaments in Cowboy history and almost as many impossible comebacks. So when Roger Staubach shifted back into his shotgun to start the second half, you had to believe anything could happen. What appeared was the ghost of Roger the Dodger, the Heisman Trophy winner of 1964, complete with the U.S. Naval Academy jump pass. With nothing to lose, Staubach opened things up and the Cowboys began to move down the field, working the middle with tight end Billy Joe Dupree, number 89, and then swinging outside to running back Robert Newhouse, number 44. In the second half alone, Staubach completed 18 of 29 for 222 yards. And when he couldn't throw, there were other ways to get the job done. In the late afternoon chill of Bush Stadium, Staubach passed and scrambled Dallas back into contention as two touchdowns shrunk the Cardinal lead to 11 points. But Dallas had started this comeback too late. Time was running out and Staubach was forced to throw nearly every play into a swarming prevent defense. The result was inevitable. Cornerback Roger Worley ended two fourth quarter threats with goal line interceptions to nail down a solid 31-17 St. Louis victory and vault the Cardinals into sole possession of first place in the NFC East. The victory plus a Detroit loss clinched a second consecutive playoff berth for a team that didn't learn to win until Don Coriel arrived from San Diego State with a plan. Now, terrific Terry Metcalf and the Cardinals are anxious to show the world that the best is yet to come. The Bear was not about to kiss and tell and growl about his Chicago Bears. Neither was quarterback Bob Avellini, a chunky hunk of rookie meat whose staggered snap count was an invitation for the over-eager Detroit Lions to come to dinner. Avellini proved to be a beggar's banquet to the Lions, who evidently were trying to re-merchandise the old black and blue myths about the NFC Central Division. When Avellini's senses and headgear were restored, the rookie from Maryland attempted to pry apart the stunning gambling Detroit defense with long-range passing. This strategy produced two interceptions, but failed to alter Avellini's style. Sooner or later, he knew the adventurous Lions would be trapped with single coverage on speedy Bo Rather number 80. All year long, the Bears have tried to unleash the splendid talents of number one draft choice Walter Payton, whose Achilles heel is the crucial fumble. Once again, Payton's inopportune turnover seemed to bury the Bears, but Bob Avellini sought a second opinion. The result was a reprieve for Payton and six points for Chicago. Avellini's knack of swallowing the Lions' secondary in large gulps can be attributed to perfect protection and Bo Rather's elusive patterns. 
Down deep, straight ahead power football produced Peyton's second touchdown and a 19-7 lead for the Bears. It was only a matter of time before Lion quarterback Joe Reed found the soft parts in the Bears' flabby zone. Marlon Briscoe, a gypsy receiver, caught two touchdowns. The second covered 59 yards and returned the lead to Detroit 21-19. Briscoe turned up lame, and so did the Lions' defense. Their gambling style of play was reflected by linebacker Charlie Weaver, number 59, whose inside blitzes opened up the sidelines for valuable gains by Walter Payton. This Russian roulette style of play cost Detroit the game when Chicago caught them in a full blitz and rookie Roland Harper, number 35, scored the winning touchdown. Roland Harper was Chicago's final draft choice and his only entry in their press guide notes that at Louisiana Tech he was the blocking back for Charles Quick Six McDaniel the man he beat out for a spot on the Bears roster. Such stuff for what fairy tales and victories are made of. Bears 25, Lions 21. There is a fairy tale quality about San Francisco, but not the 49ers, a team whose dreams of a title are as worthless as fool's gold. Another team whose dreams crashed on the rocks of reality and the league's toughest schedule were the Houston Oilers. Under the measured steps and homespun philosophies of Bum Phillips, the Oilers had 10-gallon hopes of attaining a wild-card berth in the AFC playoffs. One element that has remained steadfast for Houston is its hard-hitting defense. Their three-man front allows maximum penetration by the linebackers, and what they cannot handle is usually cleaned up by nose guard Curly Culp, number 78. The Oilers limited the 49ers to a meager five yards rushing and exacted a harsh price on San Francisco receivers who braved the middle of their zone. One Oiler who's been through the old 1-13 seasons is Zeke Moore, number 22, a cornerback whose competitive edge was not dull by nine years of frustration and constant losing. Like Zeke Moore, the new Oilers have surprising resiliency and the ability to furnish the climactic play when it is most vitally needed. No one has produced more excitement than Billy Hummingbird Johnson, whose 74-yard punt return nailed down victory for Houston. Second effort runs of Ronnie Coleman gave Houston an easy 27-13 triumph. But the win proved hollow as hopes for a wild card spot were cruelly crushed by Cincinnati's victory in Philadelphia. Since moving into their incredible new gymnasium, the New Orleans Saints have won two games and lost nine. Last week they were facing the 9-2 Los Angeles Rams and less than 40,000 showed up to see what the Saints could do against a team which has given up the fewest points in the league. The answer, as usual, was not much. 
But then the Rams couldn't do much either. In the entire first half, neither team could manage a touchdown or even a field goal. But at the half, the Rams led two to nothing because of this play. In the second half, Archie Manning managed one touchdown on a pass to number 27 running back Rod McNeil. But as has been the case for the past five weeks, one touchdown was the limit for New Orleans. The Rams' offense managed none, despite some uncharacteristic trickery. The Rams did manage to score 14 points, but they came as a result of the first half safety, two field goals, a missed extra point and one of the season's most unusual special team plays. Number 57 reserve linebacker Jim Peterson said afterwards, I ran three and a half miles for that one. For the last 20 yards, I felt like I had the whole world on my back. I toyed with the idea of lateraling, but I didn't find anybody until it was too late. What a way to win a ball game. The New Orleans Saints would agree wholeheartedly with that assessment. While the Rams were squeaking by in New Orleans, Another NFC playoff team was frolicking in quite a different environment. The Minnesota Vikings thrive on their wintry climate, which certainly has not slowed their 37-year-old defensive captain, Jim Marshall, number 70. The right side of the Viking defensive line still consists of Jim Marshall and Alan Page, number 88. And these are two reasons why the Green Bay Packers who had scored 68 points in their two previous games, scored only three last week, and had only six first downs all day. John Hadle and his replacement, Don Milan, could make almost no headway against the NFC's top-ranked defense. And conversely, the Packers could not stop the NFC's top-ranked offense. Number 44, Chuck Foreman, is on the verge of becoming Minnesota's first ever 1,000-yard runner and pro football's first ever triple crown winner as he leads the NFC in rushing, receiving, and in scoring. There's another member of the Viking backfield who's having a pretty good season. Last week, Fran Tarkinen threw his 21st, 22nd, and 23rd touchdown passes of the year. Two of them to number 42, John Gilliam, who was covered man for man by third-year cornerback Perry Smith. Said Gilliam after the game, it was stupid. I don't know why they didn't give him any help. With an offensive line and a quarterback like ours, we made him look like a fool. I wish we could play Green Bay every week. They're the only team that really plays me honest. Fran Tarkinen found Gilliam for seven of his 20 completions for the day. The Vikings are now 11 and one, and Fran Tarkenton is just one short of John Unitas' lifetime record, 290 touchdown passes. The crowds in Philadelphia grow uglier each week in response to the Eagles' winless ways. And last week in their final home appearance, Philadelphia reached new heights of incompetence. Cincinnati's Bill Kolar's tackle put the Bengals in go position at the Eagles' one-yard line. 
One play later, number 43, Ed Williams encountered no opposition at the goal line, and the route was officially on. Bengal quarterback Ken Anderson came on to celebrate a return to action from bruised ribs by throwing for 223 yards. And when the league's most consistent passer couldn't find a receiver, he challenged the Eagle defenders on foot. The moments of excitement were few, however, as the Bengals' offense simply blew away a confused and dispirited opponent. And nowhere was that spirit more noticeably missing than in the defensive line play of the Eagles. Bengals entered the game ranked next to last in rushing offense in the AFC. Yet they roared through the Eagle defense for 258 yards. Cincinnati's subs mercifully slowed down the cavalcade of points scored. But when John Reeves put the last of the Bengal points on the board, the beleaguered coach of the Eagles, Mike McCormick, was left to stand in the heat of yet another humiliating defeat, 31-0. Over in Pittsburgh, the Cleveland Browns also lost, but they at least did it with dignity. Neil Craig's safety blitz was indicative of Cleveland's fired-up defense, and Mike Phipps' passing helped keep the Browns competitive in the game's first half. Shortly after this Steve Holden reception, Greg Pruitt edged over the Pittsburgh goal line to gain a 10-7 advantage. The real shocker came on the following kickoff when number 44, Mike Collier, literally handed Cleveland a touchdown. Number 80, rookie Willie Miller recovered, and suddenly halftime scores around the country incredulously read Cleveland 17, Pittsburgh 7. But Cleveland's moment of rapture was soon to wilt under the powerful Steeler attack. Number 32, Franco Harris, pounded out 103 yards rushing to exceed, for the third time, 1,000 yards in a season. Once again, Franco seems to be reaching his peak just as the playoffs approach. And against the Browns, his nose for the goal was good for two touchdowns. Throughout the second half, the Steelers moved confidently through the Browns as Terry Bradshaw to number 88, Lynn Swan, clicked for two touchdowns. At game's end, it was all back in perspective. Steelers 31, Browns 17. For Baltimore Colt head coach Ted Marshabrota, seven straight victories are the end result of a potent offense and an awesome defense. And built on the muscle of young studs like number 78 John Dutton, the energetic Colts are making a name for themselves. Quarterbacks attempting to solve the Baltimore defense have met with frustration, pain, and embarrassment. The frustration comes from trying to throw while laying on the ground. The pain comes from being one of the 55 quarterback sacks which the Colts have forced thus far to lead the entire NFL. And the embarrassment? That's a result when a pass filters into the hands of a Colt defender who totes it all the way back the distance.
In Baltimore's 21 to nothing blitz of the New York Giants last Sunday, the Colt defense scored its second touchdown in two weeks. Linebacker Stan White scooted in from 23 yards out as Baltimore tuned up for this week's showdown with the division-leading Miami Dolphins. Blending a tenacious, rock-tough defense with a score from anywhere offense, led by rifle arm Bird Jones, the Colts have shown the ability to get a lot of yards in a hurry. However, more than just a big play team, a steady ground attack pace by all-purpose runner Lydell Mitchell affords Baltimore the luxury of controlling opponents with a slashing ball control attack. Last Sunday, Mitchell became the first Baltimore runner ever to rush for over a thousand yards in a season, a feat surpassing even the great Lenny Moore and Alan Amici. But amid the joys of victory were omens of future uncertainty, as late in the game, Burt Jones was forced out with re-injured ribs. Jones's recovery for the coming confrontation with Miami will be vital to the Colts. But while one quarterback was tasting the bitter, which often accompanies the sweet, down in Miami, another quarterback was countering the nervousness of a first NFL start with a smile. Don Strock would be making his debut as a starter, replacing injured legends Bob Greasy and Earl Morrill. And one might excuse Dolphin coach Don Shula for perhaps being a little nervous about starting a virtual rookie against the contending Buffalo Bills. But if there was any nervousness on the part of Shula or Strock, it never showed. Strock capped the Dolphins' second possession with his first NFL touchdown, and then proceeded to launch precision passes that exploited the Bills' secondary. A string of 11 consecutive completions included two scoring shots, as Don Strock took command of the Dolphin ball control offense. Both scores were sure throws to reliable Howard Twilley, number 81, and the swiftness with which they were accomplished was a sight to behold. Strzok's success was contagious and ignited the Dolphin defense, a group laboring under an injury syndrome who proceeded to squeeze down hard on Buffalo superstar Orange Juice Simpson. After dominating the Bills well into the third quarter, the Dolphins finally succumbed to the high-powered Buffalo scoring machine who, under the direction of Joe Ferguson, proceeded to make a game of it. Two touchdown passes, one to J.D. Hill, and the other to O.J. Simpson, closed the Bills within three points of the lead, 24-21. Faced with the possibility of losing a game, which at one time seemed on the verge of becoming a runaway, Miami buttoned up for some game-breaking football and manufactured the effort that would finalize the win. <laughs> 
Don Nottingham's 56-yard burst of the one set up the clincher, which provided the Dolphins with a 31-21 victory. Forced to play catch-up in the remaining minutes, Joe Ferguson fell prey to the no-name defense, which throttled the Bills' final efforts. While eliminating the Buffalo Bills, the Miami Dolphins may have stepped out of the frying pan and into the fire, because this Sunday, the shake-and-bake Baltimore Colts hope to fillet the Dolphins in their hometown of and of Memorial Stadium. The Dolphins have shown they can win despite injuries to key personnel, but they'll be facing the young Colts, who, after losing four out of their first five, have put together seven straight wins. Two storybook teams will vie for a glass slipper only one can wear. Everyone loves to see the San Diego Chargers coming to town because it's always fattening for the win column. Last week in Arrowhead Stadium, Coach Tommy Prothro got together with Coach Paul Wigan and seemed to be lamenting the size of the problems he's faced this season. But Paul Wigan couldn't help because a loss to the Chargers would mean red-cheeked embarrassment for him and his team. However, that's just what the Chiefs suffered, beginning with the opening kickoff. was a trend that continued throughout the day as the oft-battered Chargers turned ferocious ball hawks. Running back Ricky Young, number 34, capitalized on one turnover, and his team led 7-6. Inspired by their early lead, the Chargers fulfilled their nickname and made life miserable for aging Lynn Dawson. But while some San Diego players have gotten lean and mean in defeat, some could not forget their nice guy ways. But last week, the lean and mean prevailed, and the lightning bolt brigade struck hard, fast, and often on defense. Offense quarterback Dan Fouts ran into some interception problems midway through the game, and it looked as if the Chiefs were about to turn the tide of battle against their winless opponents. This interception return by Emmett Thomas set up a perfect pass from Dawson to number 85, Barry Pearson. And for the first time all day, Kansas City led 20 to 14. It seemed that it was time for the Chargers to fold, time for them to line up their 12 losses like goose eggs in a cart and head for home. But last Sunday was different as Fouts continued to hammer the Kansas City secondary. He hit tight end Pat Curran three times for 95 yards on the day. And then once in close, it was up to young players like Sam Scarber, number 30, a first year man from New Mexico to take it in. Ahead by 21 to 20, Fouts continued to stay with what had worked. Again, he hit Curran, who leads all tight ends in the AFC in reception. Then, finding his receivers covered, Fouts scrambled gingerly up the middle and into the end zone to make the winning margin 28-21. 
a score which gave the Chargers at least one special moment in an otherwise depressing season. Like the Chargers, the Jets too have suffered this year. But last week in New England, the breaks began to come their way. Finally, after eight straight losses, they were headed in the right direction. Led by number 26, Carl Garrett's score, the New Yorkers jumped to an early lead. New England quarterback Steve Grogan retaliated against the Jets secondary, which at times seemed to be attending another game. But Randy Vataha's score was the last they would give up until the battle was decided. And the man who made the decision was number 44, John Riggins, who pounded the Pats for 154 hard-earned rushing yards. Twice, Riggins crunched through the New England line to score. The big running back from Kansas has been an erratic performer throughout most of his five-year career, but last week, even a slight injury could not stop it. In fact, when Riggins is right in mind and body, there's very little that can stop him. This 37-yard chug gave the Jets a 30 to 14 last quarter lead, which seemed safe enough until New England's version of number 44 took wing. Don Calhoun is a second year running back from Kansas State, and his score left the Patriots trailing by only nine points. But nine points was a little more than New England could make up because their next score didn't come until the last play of the game, as the Jets won 30 to 28 and now share the cellar in the AFC East with New England.